Good afternoon and welcome to the 143rd of the COVID calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Today we will discuss writing cultural history and the pandemic with Rebecca Onion, staff writer at Slate. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also watch COVID calls on Facebook Live and on Periscope. You can hear COVID calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID calls. Please help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and topics. Please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, October 7th, 2020, there are 1,051,446 deaths globally from COVID-19, according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. There are 7,506,743 cases in the United States. That's up from 7,467,186 cases reported yesterday. There are now a total of 211,108 deaths reported in the United States from COVID-19, up from 210,355 reported yesterday. These statistics, I'm sure, will be discussed tonight in the vice presidential debate between Vice President Pence and Kamala Harris. As a way to bring some humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic in some way, and I'd like to continue that now. Headline, Kimberly Nguyen, writer who explored Cambodian roots, dies at 33. This is written by Penelope Green and appeared April 15th in the New York Times. Kimberly Nguyen's writing was as restrained as the Cambodian elders she conjured in her fiction, short stories that sketched precarious, haunted lives in a chilly new country. But her personality was exuberant as the rugby she played at Vassar for the team so determined, said Kesey Lehman, a novelist and her creative writing professor there, that the players would regularly come to class concussed. Most people are reserved in their personality, but in their writing, everything busts out. Mr. Lehman said. Kim was the opposite. She would tell stories, so it appeared that nothing had happened, but oh man, so much was happening. You know sort of immediately the kids that are going to make themselves into writers, he added. Kids with relentless imagination and uber desire to revise. Kim had all of that, but also had, as she would say, honest stuff for her people. Ms. Nguyen's work was imprinted with her parents' experience living under the brutal Khmer Rouge regime. Her mother's family had lived in a refugee camp in Thailand for three years before coming to the United States in 1982, eventually setting, settling in Revere, Massachusetts, where Ms. Nguyen grew up. She died of the novel coronavirus on April 5th on the way to the hospital in nearby Everett. Her cousin, Tina Yang, said she was 33. Ms. Nguyen was born on May 6, 1986. For the last six years, she taught English at Brooklyn Latin in New York, an academically rigorous public high school with a classical liberal arts curriculum and a diverse student body. She was passionate about anime, Harry Potter, and her students, whom she mentored with fierceness, humor, and scented stickers. After hours, they crowded her classroom. Ms. Nguyen earned a bachelor's degree in English from Vassar in 2008, and a Master of Fine Arts degree from Long Island University, Brooklyn in 2016. Her writing has appeared in Pank, Hyphen Magazine, and The Adroit Journal. She's had numerous fellowships and residencies and was at work on a novel called Lion's Tooth about a Cambodian American family living in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She's survived by her brother, Stephen Nguyen, her mother, Vi Yang, and her father, Hai Van Nguyen. Many of Ms. Nguyen's students were, like her, first-generation Americans and would go on to be the first in their families to attend college. In an online tribute, one wrote, Two years ago, I was still that immigrant kid struggling with English. I felt excluded. I felt embarrassed for not being able to speak for myself like the others. But you believed in me. You and your positive energy brought me out of darkness. I'd 
like to turn to our discussion for today, and I'm really pleased to introduce my guest, Rebecca Onion. Rebecca writes about culture, history, and childhood for magazines, newspapers, and the internet. She's currently a staff writer at Slate.com. She's also written for Aon Magazine, the Boston Globe's Ideas section, the Virginia Quarterly Review, the Atlantic's website, Topic Magazine, the Austin American Statesman, PBS American Experience website, and many other venues. She holds a PhD and a master's degree in American studies from the University of Texas at Austin and a bachelor's degree in American studies from Yale University. Her book, Innocent Experiments, Childhood and the Culture of Public Science in the United States was published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2016. Rebecca Onion, welcome to COVID Calls. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> It's great to see you and looking forward to catching up. And you have yeah. been so prolific in this time. If you don't mind, yeah, so if you don't mind, I'm just going to ask you the, the question I always start with, which is uh, where you're calling from and what the pandemic is looking like there today. So I'm calling from Athens, Ohio, which is where I live and I haven't left since March. So that's where I'm going to be. Um, and we have Ohio University here, and like a lot of other college towns, especially in the Midwest, it feels like um, things have gotten worse since the kids came back. Um, OU brought back only a portion of them at first, and then they added on a few more recently. And so um, things are kind of, the numbers are taking up a little bit right now. Um, it's weird because I work from home and my um, husband was between jobs when this started, so he's taken on the childcare. So as a pandemic parent, I've got like a pretty ideal setup. I mean, <laughs> he may not feel, like he's enjoying it, but you know, his life is a little um, different from mine right now. Um, but as a result, we don't have, we just don't have that much risk right now. So it sort of feels like watching what's happening with the pandemic in Athens is like a little distant from us in a way that it probably doesn't feel for you if you're, be teaching at all in a classroom. Yeah. With the university there, though, you've been at the uh, front lines. You must have seen several things. I mean, the sort of issues around bringing students back. Can you update mm -hmm. us? I mean, it's one of the biggest universities in the United States by student population, isn't it? Oh, you must be thinking of the Ohio State University. Ah, Did we okay. get it mixed up? <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Boy, that'll get me. I was going to say, I'll give me all sort of trouble in the Midwest. <laughs> but how many students are there? Um, oh my God, this is going to get me in trouble. Um, I think it's somewhere in the, in the singular thousands. Okay. Um, okay. so, but it does, it does expand the town population by like a double or a double and more, um, when they come. So, yeah. And so, and it, it's sort of been, um, piled on top, like with a lot of other universities of a big, um, bunch of staff and faculty layoffs that happened mm -hmm. mostly in April, there was another kind of round over the summer at one point. So there's a lot of like anxiety and animosity um, kind of roiling around. Again, I think a common a common situation. Absolutely. And how yeah. did the Black Lives Matter protests play out there in Athens? Um, we have a we had them. Mm -hmm. You know, we have had some. Um, I would not say that they were like particularly, I don't know, I, I shouldn't say that because I um, I don't have a full picture, but I don't think that they've really happened very much recently. Um, for a while, there were people lining the main kind of like um, thoroughfare and with signs and stuff. Um, and some, a couple of scattered counter protesters, but this is a really liberal town. So it's sort of like, you mm -hmm. know, um, the streets are full of the, there's a lot of yard signs and and representation of the movement. So there's that, but it's also a very white town. So there's also that. I've seen polling that says that uh, Ohio is somehow in reach for Joe Biden. I know. Believe me, I'm going to vote early. I think I'm going to go tomorrow. Really? <laughs> I want to get it in before any other shenanigans happen. Yeah, before it's the like, maelstrom. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's get a sense of your work. I mean, your, your, your cultural palette is very broad. You write on many different topics. Your expertise, um, a lot of it is uh, writing about children and families and the history mm -hmm. of science and history of medicine. And you wrote this book, Innocent Experiments, which came out in 2016, which from a historian's perspective is like came out yesterday. You must still yeah. be in shock. I'm still in shock <laughs> that I published a book and it was 2011. Um, right. So um, 
tell us a little bit of the intellectual trajectory, the kinds of mm. questions that got you to the book, the things you were interested in exploring, because I think getting some of that on the table will help us understand your writing and thinking now about the pandemic. Sure. Um, well, ever since I wrote my senior thesis in 1999 about the Columbine shootings, I've been really interested in uh, youth and childhood and its relationship to politics, um, people's perceptions of what's going on with kids and what's going on with teenagers and what's going on with parenthood, which as I became a parent became more and more important to me <laughs> to think about this. But the sort of the politics of that domestic relationship um, between kids and parents and the way that gets talked about in relationship to what's going on in the country, I think is the sort of the broadest way to paint it. So my book was about the way that people thought about kids as scientists and how that affected and shaped how they thought about science as a prospect. Um, so sometimes it's like really a lot about ideas, like the idea of X, which is like such a American studies, cultural history thing to do. Um, but when I've been working for Slate, what's been really interesting is to, um, well, sometimes I'll still write stuff that's sort of more like that. Um, it's also much more often closer to the ground um, and looking at things that are happening now and interviewing people who are undergoing it and writing about my own experience sometimes um, in a way that obviously in academia you wouldn't necessarily do as much. So um, just a little bit more about the about the book. Um, mm -hmm. What kind of... Um, and I, I appreciate what you said in the sort of the American studies tradition of sort of trying to somehow capture a culture or an idea or a mentality yeah. at a certain kind of time. What kind of sources do you use in that project? Oh, yeah. Ooh, I love thinking about it. It, it, though it does seem like a thousand years ago. And I want to say that it came out um, like five days before the election that Trump won. <laughs> so I basically never promoted it or did anything with it. It's like lost. And again, a thing that I think a lot of academics publishing books right now probably resonate with. Um, Absolutely, yeah. They're totally unconnected from public health um, or democracy or whatever other thing. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so I the sources were, um, a lot of them came from sort of uh, enterprises where adults were trying to shape science for kids. So um, the history of the Brooklyn Children's Museum. So I went to the, you know, the Children's Museum archives and looked at the different um, ways that they represented their project um, in newsletters and um, clippings and stuff like that. Um, same with the American Museum of Natural History, although that ended up sort of dropping out a little bit in the book. Um, and the same with, um, I, I tried to write around the idea of science fairs as a project, like sort of as a political project. So obviously that became really salient in the Cold War um, when the Intel what, what is now the Intel Science Talent Search was created. At that point, it was the Westinghouse Science Talent, Science Talent Search. Um, and just sort of the ideas that all that stuff was at the Smithsonian, all the sort of records of the adults who created that project um, and what they talked about between themselves and how they represented it to the public. Um, I have a million other examples. Each chapter is a case study. I'm not going to go uh, through them all. No, that's yeah, but, a, but a lot of times it was about what adults thought thought that they were doing and talking well, about. Yeah. So you must have been tracking pretty closely. I mean, these last few years, the battleground over climate change has oh, extended yeah. all the way into, I don't know about pre-K, but certainly into elementary mm -hmm. school education. Mm -hmm. I know state legislatures have, have been fighting about what goes in social studies curricula, science curricula, and it's not just high school, right? I mean, I, I, yeah. is that, what, what's your sort of sense of how the science wars have actually moved into the sphere of childhood in these last few years? Well, that stuff really interests me because one of the major things that, you know, the 20th century, so my work was about the, mostly about the 20th century, the zero zeros through 60s, 70s. Um, and although, as you often do with a history book, you have to have a conclusion that brings it up to the present day, like in one giant sweep. <laughs> um, but largely it was about this sort of like a more optimistic time. Um, and what really interests me about the discourse around talking to kids about climate change is this idea that it's going to um, like mess with their emotions in some way or like depress mm -hmm. them or like make them scared. And that was something that um, I wrote about Greta Thunberg, I, I guess, like to... Uh, 
before the pandemic, <laughs> whatever that was last summer or something back when she, you know, all of a sudden became like a right wing talking point. Um, and that was something that, that they, people who were critiquing her position within the movement would talk about a lot. It's like, oh, she's just a depressed young lady. Like something's, something is wrong with her. She just needs help. Like, which is like this ableist discourse around her m mental health situation, but whatever. Um, but there's, there's also, there's something really interesting to me about it because for a long time, proponents of science education would say, what we need is to um, like show the parts of science that like ignite the imagination and like get people excited and like create hope for the future. And kids were seen as this like perfect place to do that. Like that you could, um, you know, like basically spark curiosity, spark the kind of inventiveness that like if you watch a three-year-old play, you see it just like in space, like everywhere. Um, and and the climate change education conversation, I feel like kind of draws on those previous ideas that like science, science taught to kids should be about like creating hope or like creating optimism. And like, this is the opposite of that. And we don't want to teach them that everything's going to be terrible. Um, but the problem is that a lot of the science says that maybe it will be terrible. <laughs> so, so I think that... Um, yeah, that, that connection between the conversation about emotional health and learning about potentials for the future is what I see. Why do you think that conservatives felt that it was fair game to pick on Greta? I mean, even uh -huh. uh, I taught a course this summer with Yan Sil Kang on, um, she's a brilliant historian, um, and we got a chance to teach together a climate change history class, and we used... Oh, okay. um, we used part of the congressional testimony where Greta appeared and the representative who, his name escapes me now, I guess I blocked it out, but who really <laughs> went after her, tried to embarrass her, tried to trip her up. It just seemed, yeah. I mean, it brought so many issues to the fore. The one is that she was, I think still is, the most articulate person in the world mm -hmm. for the moral case about climate change policy and climate change science. Yeah. And, and so, and she's still a minor. Um, so she's a force to be reckoned with, but at the same time, um, one wishes that our public officials would be respectful to children. Well, I'm completely fascinated by that part of it because I have, I have a long summary interest in and have never written like a giant comprehensive piece about because I keep getting diverted by other things because the life of a internet writer is that you write two to three pieces a week. Right. Yeah. And, like, I need you to that. write that piece I just yeah. mentioned, but also the other things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and like, it's fine. I enjoy doing it, but it, it, it doesn't leave much space for a big project like the one I'm about to describe, which is uh, I'm really interested in the politics of um, like parental discipline and the intergenerational um, like permissiveness or like rigorousness. So like since the 20th century, this has been a thing like, like liberals are too like lax with their children. Like they listen to them too much and they like let them run roughshod over things. And, um, and now it's sort of evolved into this thing where like liberals are like too coddling of their children and they spoil them and they whatever. And then on the other side, the liberals are like, the right is like authoritarian and creates fascists through their child rearing. Um, and this has been something that people have been talking about since uh, World War II, um, when everyone got fascinated by, you know, after World War II, everyone was like, how did Hitler become that? <laughs> like, <laughs> and there were all these theories about his childhood and the, the way that he was potty trained and all this stuff. Um, but anyway, so I do think that the right is sort of when they critique our sort of the way that we listen to Greta or like the, the way that we kind of like heed her moral authority. A lot of the critiques of it seem to be from the position of like, like why would you listen to your kid when she says that she knows better than you about something? Um, like I never would. And so um, like the moral authority of a, of a adolescent doesn't read the same way. Mm -hmm. um, although then you could look at the fact that there are certainly um, you know, who are those couple of names? Their names are escaping me, but there's a couple of kids from the Parkland. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High mm -hmm. School, who turned out to be um, like conservative, like pro gun activists. Right. And they'll, and in those situations, the people on the right are happy to 
you know, host them and have them be part of the conversation. Sure. Um, so it, as with everything, there's like a little bit of disingenuity on both sides maybe. Um, but I do think that that was at least in the questioning of her was sort of the way that um, that was trying to be framed. And then of course there's a lot of like misogyny and ableism as, you know, right. kind of th thrown in the, thrown in the mess. I wonder um, if you see similar kind of battles playing out then a around the way the pandemic and the science around the pandemic mm -hmm. has been aimed at children. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've seen some of this that teachers in part, I think just to survive in March, but also because they really wanted to engage their students. You know, they talked about the pandemic yeah. in history classes, but also in, in science classes. Hmm. So it becomes another venue for the, you know, the childhood um, K through 12 education becomes another venue in which maybe, and we are having a science war about this pandemic, whether or not people yeah. want to believe it. Yeah. Um, yeah. plays out but i mean it's been so it's yeah. so i mean i hope that people are capturing these lessons and you know what kind of assignments ninth graders are getting about the pandemic right now i haven't seen i don't know do you know if anybody's working on that i haven't seen anything i don't that. but you just gave me a great story idea that's a great idea i should write about that <laughs> now, now you have to now you have to write <laughs> yeah. that's right. um, hey man i'll take it i'll take story ideas anywhere i can get them but what oh, would you yeah. expect what would you expect oh. Well, you know, it's doubly interesting because um, those lessons in a lot of cases will be overheard by parents or like have the potential to be overheard by parents. So that makes it even, I mean, you know, of course, like whenever you're teaching, there's the possibility that the parent might see the worksheet or like hear a report from the kid of what they're learning. But the idea that there's a, a parent possibly in the next room who might disagree with what you're saying. Um, I mean, I've heard sort of anecdotally that teachers are getting a little bit more crap for um, like social studies lessons that are pro racial justice or, you know, bring up social justice issues. Um, I haven't heard that about anything scientific about the pandemic, but I would, it would be very interesting to know if that was happening. I sort of feel like, I wonder if maybe, um, like, I feel like more people believe in the science around the pandemic than the media makes me feel like. I wonder. I don't, I wonder if you've seen polls, but I sometimes feel like. Like when I encounter just regular people around that aren't like submerged in Twitter, they seem a little more like believing in what's going on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the, I mean, I don't know. All I do all day is like hear anecdotal reports of anti-maskers and like sure. read Trump's terrible perspective on it. Um, but I don't know. I, I just wonder whether that's, the, I wonder how salient that is in, in relationship to the classroom. Yeah, I agree with you. I guess I haven't seen any polls and it would only be, I mean, everybody just has their own um, you know, what they're observing on the street. I sure mm -hmm. see a lot of um, adolescents wearing masks with parents mm -hmm. who aren't. Oh, that's and interesting. I, and, but I mean, this is a yeah. the sample size is, is ridiculously small. I mean, I yeah. wonder what people are seeing in it. You know, I, I think there have certainly been times where public health messaging is pushed out through the schools with the intention mm -hmm. that that then has an impact um, in the household in general. I think a a lot of emphasis of the American Lung Heart Association, Lung Association on smoking. I mean, we used to always yeah. get really strong mm. lessons and pamphlets about smoking, which were intended to make their way to our grandparents, I think, and to our yeah. parents back in the yeah. 80s. And maybe even some of that war on drugs stuff was similarly not just for the kids, mm. it was also for the household. That's I wonder cool. if the pandemic stuff is working the same way. Yeah. I, I mean, I feel like I've seen that. Um, I actually saw that in my research for my book that people would say, oh, we want America, the American public to be more science minded. Like we want them to have more information about science and care more about what scientists are doing. And so they would see the science fair as a way to like kind of convert the adults in, in the household. Um, and and I, th I think I remember the National Tubercul Tuberculosis Association doing that as well way back in the teens or 20s or whenever that would have been. Um, course, the big, the big so, yeah. difference is you would have even in the Reagan years, I mean, the funding for that stuff came from the federal government. There's not yeah. going to be any pandemic awareness pamphlets nope. coming out of the CDC. <laughs> you wouldn't think so. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess I do have that like advertising campaign, but with Dennis Quaid in it or whatever. But I think it's like all focused on talking about how great everything is. So oh, I missed, I missed that one. Oh, yeah.
I just want to <laughs> remind folks that you're listening to COVID calls. I'm talking uh, with Rebecca Onion today, staff writer for Slate. And um, let's talk a little bit about, so you write on a lot of topics and we've just mm -hmm. been hitting some of those themes. You write a lot about science and history and medicine. Mm -hmm. And the challenge that you have that a lot of my guests don't have is that you have to reach an audience. Um, and, uh -huh. um, and you, you have to mobilize your research talents um, and and then produce something that hits not only readers who are maybe expert in a topic, but also people who may be just hearing about a topic for the first time, but they want to know yes. 2,000 words about it or 3,000 mm -hmm. words about it. So I want to get, first I want to take the temperature of like, what's the public's appetite for history of medicine and pandemic oh. history and science right now? You know, it's interesting because, um, I feel like there was like, a, I don't know, like early on um, in April, I believe it was mid-April or early May, I interviewed, um, I do sometimes do Q&As with historians and other social scientists kind of well, with anyone. I've done it with photographers and stuff like that too, but yeah. usually it's historians because of my interests. Um, and I did one with, uh, ooh, I'm gonna, I don't, I've never heard her name pronounced out loud, Elizabeth Outka, O U T K A, mm -hmm. who's a, um, I believe she's actually a literature scholar, but she wrote a, a extremely fortuitously timed book that came out um, earlier this year about the 1918 19 flu um, and memory of it and the question of memory of it. Um, and so, you know, I mean, everyone who has sort of been following this probably knows that one of the notable things about that flu is that, it, that for years people were like that no one remembered it like it made no dent it made no dent in policy it made no dent in literature it made no dent in, in drama and and all this and so her argument was instead that actually there are um a lot of traces of it in modernist literature but that it's sort of told in a roundabout way um i found it really convincing and fascinating mm -hmm. um and especially because a lot of it is about the sort of the body experience of having the sickness and what that felt like and what it felt like to watch your loved ones have it and what it felt like for people who had it and then um, recovered but were always like diminished in some way well, or changed mm -hmm. in some way. Um, and so these are all things that um, are kind of a lot easier to maybe write about in literature, like you can see them in literature in a way that, mm -hmm. you, know, mm -hmm. and, you know, you can, she includes some survivor stories um, where you can, when read in particular ways, you can see that stuff. But um, just reading her book and and writing about it and talking to her, it got me thinking a lot about um, survivors of COVID who might not die but who might be changed. Um, but anyway, so uh, the reason I brought that up is that that Q and A actually did really well traffic wise. Um, yeah. And so, and that, but that also hit at a time when there was like a huge appetite for pandemic content. So mm -hmm. in like March, April, May, um, we just like got really good traffic and we're just pumping things out and everyone had a lot of adrenaline. I'm sure you remember Sure, yeah. <laughs> when you started this, this actual program. Yeah. Um, and so, and that was also when it was sort of, um, especially when, if you could hit on a topic that was historical, like that one that everyone was sort of, because everyone was thinking like 1918, 19, like what, like what, what did I learn about it in school? Like, what was that even like? What happened? Like how many people died? And you know, like, why is that just like a, like a null space in my memory? Um, and so it really, I think that's why it resonated with people. Um, but I had a hard time finding, I, I don't know, like I read at that around that time, I was sort of reading a lot of histories of epidemics and plagues and mm -hmm. stuff like that, trying to see, you know, what else could it be? Like, how else could it be talked about? Um, another time that I was able to kind of do a connection that seemed to work with the readers, I did a Q&A with Catherine Olivarius, mm -hmm. who um, writes about yellow fever um, and wrote about yellow fever in New Orleans. And she's the one, she wrote for the New York Times and that's how I found out about her. She wrote for the New York Times about um, the idea of immunoprivilege. Um, and her all her work is about um, how having the yellow fever and becoming immune to it in New Orleans was like seen as like a necessary thing that you had to do. This is among white elites. So they like had a whole sort of social system based around, um, you know, who had had it 
you know, and could 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 operate without fear in right, the right, social right, milieu right. of New Orleans, which now that Trump is like going around saying that he's immune and that now he can, you know, be the one to teach us all about COVID is like is becoming even more relevant, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. But um, but that was one where, you know, the social system around the disease, yeah. um, the experience of it, uh, that stuff seemed to really resonate as well with readers, like the idea that a particular disease at a particular time in a particular place has like a social system around it and that it's not mm -hmm. sort of inevitable that it's going to be a particular way, but that it collides with different, you know, ways that people are with each other to create, in this case, like, it just sort of sounded terrible. <laughs> like you had to, you had to, um, you know, have yellow fever and get through it to, to live there basically. Um, yeah. And a lot of stuff in there about, you know, business elites not wanting to close down because they didn't want to lose, you know, commerce and stuff like that. That kind of stuff also, you know, it connects and resonates. Yeah. Is this, a, I mean, it, it strikes me the way you're describing this is that as a, in that sort of sense making period of a disaster mm -hmm. with media at our fingertips, people are hungry for history. <sighs> Yeah. In that moment, they go. They do go seeking it. I mean, I'd love to know what the page traffic for Wikipedia for 1918 was in yeah. March in America. That it was, it was probably pretty high. Like you said, it's sort of like I think I've heard about that flu, and then it gets mentioned yeah. once in the media, and then all of a sudden, and I keep an eye on this stuff too. And then two mm. or three or four people, I think John Barry particularly, he was writing a lot of Times op eds as well. He started yeah. writing, so he. Yeah. Pitched. And just in case it makes everybody feel better, I had a chance to interview John and he, even John Barry doesn't, they don't just publish every op-ed that he wants to publish. <laughs> he has to go through it too, like everybody goes through it. And, um, but it was really impressive to me to hear him talk about, you know, sort of moving into that, into that space in that moment. And the appetite was there, but mm. then pretty quickly. Yeah. It drops off. It's really interesting. I think in part because I don't know. Look, I mean, I, I we were talking about this before, but I I really feel like it's um it, it's been so long since we in the United States dealt with something deadly like this that's contagious, and we are sort of coming at it from not a totally blank slate because, you know, there's people alive who remember polio and there's certainly like the experience of the AIDS crisis and everything in the eighties and nineties around HIV. Um, but when it comes to like a widely circulating contagious disease, that's like so dangerous that we need to shut everything down. That's like a, the, uh, it's just, it's just so different right now. I don't know. Like it's the normal things that you do with, history when something big happens in public life like I, I i find it like sometimes difficult to do um direct comparisons or it's it's fraught to do direct comparisons and i say this as someone who did an entire podcast about the history of fascism right after trump was elected so like i don't i know that it's like you know i know i also know that there is there is an appetite for it but i mean it is the same thing with like when you talk about whether what we're living in is a fascist state it's like I forget who tweeted uh, someone, I think Osita Winevo, who, I'm, whose also name I'm mispronouncing, um, who used to write for Slate, who now writes for the New Republic, tweeted mm. something like, why do we have to worry so much about whether or not this is fascism? Like, it's really bad. <laughs> like right. like right. maybe, and also, you know, there's the whole thing about the fact that we had fasc we've had various, um, you know, regimes, Jim Crow regimes that are have fascist characteristics here also. So whatever. Um, all I'm saying is that there's a limited use to a lot of historical comparatives, especially in, maybe in, in the media where you're trying to do it quickly and trying to have it fit within 2000 words and be, have like a single salient idea. Mm -hmm. um, and what I much prefer to do is to try to connect stuff with um, a more recent history, like to try to give a backstory that's like, can be sort of more specific and connected um, but with American public health response to a contagious disease like COVID, like we don't ha have that really. Um, so I feel like, I don't know if that's why it seems like at first a lot of the historical stuff was um, more in demand and maybe now it's not, or I don't know if it's sort of like 
the general feeling yeah. of exhaustion with pandemic content, which, you know, <laughs> it's sort of been like, it's like interest in pandemic content was like up, up, up. And then it was like a plateau and then it was down and now it's up again. Like, it's like, like everyone's going through cycles with it. Um, well, I mean, there was, there's another aspect to that, which I find really interesting. It came out in your, um, you did an interview with the, um, with Jacqueline Wernemont, mm -hmm. who's, uh, uh, wrote a book called Numbered Lives, which I can't yeah. say enough about this book and, and so about her as a scholar. And you, I mean, this great interview with her. And, you know, I think a lot of times when, when historians or social scientists get asked about, you know, 1918 or anything, the, the tendency, of course, particularly when it's early in the disaster is what were the lessons learned from that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that and that works two ways. Sometimes the person asking you that question is an opinion writer, and they want to yeah. mobilize that to show that the that the government in power is never learned from the past, and therefore they're not to be trusted. <laughs> Other times, I think it's a little bit more in good faith to try to say, "Here's some lessons that were learned, and we should get these out out on the table." Yeah. But, but like yeah. you said, I think um, lessons learned from 1918 don't suppress the press. I don't know what else. Yeah. I mean, what. You know, the so many of these yeah. lessons, my colleague Chuck Haas at Drexel has talked about, you know, the six foot rule, which somehow mm -hmm. comes to us down from that time. And it's probably not a very good lesson learned. Yeah, probably needs to be farther than that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so there's other uses beyond lessons learned and comparisons. And I'm interested in those. And I think Jacqueline Wernermont's work really moves us in, more into that space. Like, well, here's just a problem we still grapple with. How do you conceptualize yeah. large loss of life? Yeah, and I think I, I think um, the things that I just described, the various kinds of work, and also Jacqueline Warnemont's work, um, I, I found it most useful to look at that stuff and think about um, the um, the sort of like the affective state of people who are dealing with contagion. Like I, I'm, and I know I don't want to make emotion into a transhistorical thing that's always the same. Historians of emotion would like yeah. <laughs> berate me for, for trying to do that, but um, just in in thinking about how people dealt with this stuff psychologically in years past and, and socially in years past. Um, not necessarily, I mean, the governmental stuff is just like the, our government is so different and communication is so different and um, science is so different. Um, it's just like, there's so many factors. Um, but in, in terms of sort of personhood and like mental health and like grappling with a big unseen threat like a contagious disease um like that's what sort of keeps me reading these these histories um mm -hmm. and like thinking about this stuff is like i'm just like what did what was that like like yeah mm, and you know you know a lot of these past diseases the kids died too <laughs> like a lot um and as a parent you know thinking about that a lot um i don't know and i don't know if that's I don't know if I'm speaking for my audience or if I'm just speaking for myself, but that's the stuff that um, still has me finding worth in it or interest in it. So there's another track of your of your work in the in the stories, um, a sort of thread running through, which is how parents and teachers mm -hmm. are coping and adapting <laughs> in this time. So this is the disaster beyond the event. This is the disaster as a state of living. And yeah. I think you're capturing some of the most sort of vital, like the real discussions people are having at home beyond the discussion that's always behind the discussion, like what can we do to not get sick and die? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, it's, it, but I mean, the, the real discussion is um, how, who's gonna manage the Zoom parent teacher meeting? Who's gonna, I mean, it's all of these sort of fine grained things, which are, I, I think part and parcel of daily life all the time but are now being yeah. translated through COVID life. So, I mean, just to give oh. one example, you wrote a piece in July. I'm just gonna give a little quote, quote from it. This appeared in Slate, July 31st. You said, as parents plot increasingly Byzantine care arrangements for, child, for children whose schools and daycares decide to stay closed this fall, the pod, the homeschool, the part school, the part pod, mm. leverage a local <laughs> teenager, their stress mounts over the prospect yeah. of having to mix work, childcare and education. And you suggest um, that maybe the government should consider paying 
Yeah, guess what? The government, the government didn't didn't agree with me. (laughs) Didn't agree with you, but I think, but I, I love this piece because it also shows Mm -hmm. how how quickly the policy discussions are moving. I mean, this is already a piece of historical importance because you captured a moment in that time. What was on your mind when you were writing that? Oh well, I mean, there have been a couple of times in in writing about the childcare school mess where I've written things. I think. I don't think this is the same thing, but I, so I think you're reading from a piece that was about um, my arguing that parents should get paid to just care give. And, but I also wrote a piece that was basically like, <laughs> I interviewed an epidemiologist who tweeted something about, um, uh, this is probably in like, also in late July, maybe early August, basically being like, if we were to choose to close the bars and restaurants completely, then maybe we can consider opening schools. And this is now like a really obvious argument. Like you said, it's like part of the historical record now. Like you would never write an op-ed now being like, I have an idea. (laughs) We should like prioritize schools over all of these like fun things. (laughs) And then maybe we could open. But her whole thing was, you know, obviously the idea is reduce the pool of risk in the community and every individual thing you do within the school will matter less and be less scary. Um, And if we could just say our goal is to get kids to school and what do we have to do to do that and we operated from that point of view whatever this is like a very familiar mm-hmm. argument now at the time i published yeah. it it was like a viral tweet that everyone was like oh my god yeah. what? this is a crazy idea um but anyway but it, and again it's not like that made any difference either like everyone every parent who read that or maybe not every but a lot of parents who read that were like well obviously this is how we should be reframing it but it never got reframed that way really um because of money, maybe. Right. Although that, to me, that's short-sighted too. Because what you know, there's money involved in women dropping out of the workforce, which we now find out that they are in great numbers. Absolutely. Um, and that's that's a money thing, too, for individual families and for companies and everything. Like it makes a difference. Um, obviously. Well, so I mean, I was I was writing about um, paying caregivers because I was interested in just like the way that the way that the caregiving arrangements that were being made and are still being made um, just like made everything super complicated when it seemed like if we could just have more money within the individual households, we could kind of close in on ourselves a little bit more (laughs) and be like not, um, you know, passing everything around. But, and that's sort of like what the lockdowns were meant to do. But since a lot of parents um, didn't didn't and don't have the money to not work, um, the whole idea of, locking people like having people be in a in a little circle um is was like a privilege i mean is a privilege um and so you know i mean this idea that it's funny because i interviewed you know a bunch of policy people who work on policy for early childhood policy for children and they all were like well yeah obviously (laughs) like we've been trying to get people to um you know change the the policy around the earned income tax credit so that um, lower earner, low income earners can get it and like have a child allowance like a lot of countries in Europe do so that, you know, at the levels of child poverty in this country, like the number, you know, whatever, they have the, their fact sheets ready with like, here's the number of kids that could be lifted out of poverty if we would just give everyone $100 a month as a kid. Um, and, you know, like they try for years and nothing happens. But but it's the same idea. And looking at it, and this is like a time when my like history nerd self did not include some of this research that I did. Mm-hmm. But looking at it, like I found that, um, you know, that this idea that um, parents could focus more on parenting and be more effective parents was, you know, or in the early late 19th, early 20th century, there was like a French um, obstetrician that argued that that should be done, like that there should be I forget what it was called, some French word for like mother's mother's fee or something right, <laughs> um, right. for like women with infants to just be able to concentrate. Cause you know, he saw that um, women who he took care of who were trying to continue to work rather than starve after having a baby, um, mm-hmm. but that was creating infant mortality that didn't need to be created. Um, and so, yeah, so this argument, you know has sort of gone back and forth, but in this country we no, no, you must have the right, you must have money to, to have children. And like, why do you want to have children if you can't pay for them? And what, you know, why do you, why are you making it our problem that you have kids or whatever? And that's always sort of the attitude. And now, um, it, it, I shouldn't even say it's the attitude because actually these very same pol- self-same policy people <laughs> that I interviewed were saying, 
actually there's like a lot of support for the earned income tax credit expanding to mm -hmm. more people. There's a lot of support for, um, you know, another measure that gets is getting talked about a lot and passed over because there's no more stimulus coming supposedly, apparently, who knows, mm -hmm. is that is the, is the idea of um, propping up daycares, propping up child cares, a lot of whom are having a lot of economic problems because of the lack of, you know, they can only have half the kids or, you know, they have these stringent measures and it's like, whatever, um, it's a big problem. Um, but so there is public support for that. But for whatever reason, politically, whether it's like, you know, the minority rule of the Republican Party or yeah. whatever it is, no, there is, you know, it's sexism. It's sexism. Yeah, they think that we should be working. We should be at home anyway. Yeah. So why try? Yeah. But, but I mean, this is a great example. I mean, this article that you wrote is a good example. I've talked with with public health experts on here about the principles of harm reduction, mm -hmm. which are just sort of common sense. Um, well, they're complicated. They're based on complicated, mm -hmm. great research, but they can be expressed in common sense ways, which is assume people are going to behave like they do and then provide the resources to make it less likely that they will need to behave in those ways or can behave in those ways if they're going to be harmed by them. So in other words, mm -hmm. you either you close the bars and restaurants and keep them closed, but pay the bar owners I know. and the restaurant owners and the servers so that they don't starve. And I see the same, it's an analogy to what you're talking about here with parents. If you don't want parents out and about in the workplace, if they're essential workers or whatever, mm -hmm. and that's who we're really talking about here, I yeah, think. I think so, yeah. Then pay them to not have to do that as a public yeah. health measure, not just because you you feel bad as a liberal, but because actually you care about public health. I mean, I think that's what you've tapped yeah. into with some of this work. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it has to do with like a, I mean, another measure that people, that people in more white collar jobs are taking advantage of is the extended um, FMLA. Uh, you know, I've taken advantage of it a couple of times, like it, to patch holes and care. Um, but it's, it's something that is, um, you know, there's like all these like, like, uh, like things that got put around it in the negotiation process where Republicans would say, oh, no, and companies under 50 don't have to adhere to this and companies over 150, whatever, it just like made it so that not everybody could take advantage of it. Um, and it also is only two thirds of your salary anyway. So, you know, Slate generously tops us up, but not everyone's going to do that. Um, anyway, so yeah, so that that was a good example of a measure that was meant to do that. You know, it's meant to be kind of compassionate and say, okay, we recognize this is going to be a hard year. Um, it expires in December, by the way, and I don't think it's been renewed. Um, and we're going to, we're going to make it more possible for you to do the right thing. But then part of me is just like, I actually don't know what they think the right thing is. Like, and now it's becoming more and more clear. I feel like what, what, uh, the, like an obvious solution, like pay the parents to stay home is like only obvious to me and not obvious to people who want to have enough people to like man all the service jobs. <laughs> um, and so, you know, that is obviously what is sort of in, probably in the back of everyone's mind. Um, when they make it harder, which what is inhumane and shitty, yeah. but you know, America. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I wanna, so yeah, still, she, you just summarized your article beautifully, but you, people should still read it. Um, yeah. I, I want to turn to another one that you, you published on September 26th um, uh, about uh, having young children at this time. You don't know what I'm talking oh, yeah. about. And I, I bet so. you've gotten a lot of reaction from this. And I want to just, I, again, I, it's so beautifully written. I want to just read a, a sentence. Do you mind if I read the first sentence? The, the, oh, the lead? Sure. so good. Yeah, yeah. Go um, I went into labor on the day of Donald Trump's inauguration and my daughter was born the day after as women <laughs> marched in numbers on the Capitol. She was a massive young lady in the pink of health throughout her early childhood. I wondered many times whether her birth date means she's cursed to live in the worst America yet. In 2020, I realized that whatever her timing might mean for her own quality of life, having a very young, very oblivious person to care for mm -hmm. through these years of panic has been an absolute godsend for my own mental health. Yep. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I was very worried while writing this whole thing. So, you know, if you can do the math, so my daughter's three and a half. Um, and she'll turn four on the next inauguration week, whenever that is, you know, whoever, whatever kind of feelings we have yeah. around that. Um, and, and it's just, um, you know, I, I was worried about writing it because I was worried that I would sound oblivious. And I 
think I managed not to because I didn't get any e angry email, um, which is good. I mean, because my whole I, uh, part of my whole point in describing like how much it's helped me to not that uh, it's helped me so much to be able to be with her and not have to think about work at the same time, especially when my work is like basically getting immersed in the internet and thinking about everything that's happening. Like that's like my job. <laughs> and so her, uh, you know, the, the times that I'm with her, I don't look at the internet and I just be with her, um, which was a policy that I had before the pandemic started. And then um, because of the sort of the lucky or unlucky situation that I've had, um, you know, whatever, the different factors that have come together to allow me not to have to try to work and care for her at the same time have made it um, so that that mental health benefit has carried over into the pandemic and been like, I swear to God, it's the only reason I sleep at night is that is that like I can have these like blocks of two hours or three hours or on the weekend a day where I just am like, I don't know. I mean, it's not like I'm constantly interacting with her. Like I'm a, a try to be like a more, um, you know, whatever, but it's like I'm doing household chores and she's playing or I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just like in the like physical world. Um, we watch the birds a lot. Like we go in the woods. It's like everything that they tell you to do and that I imagine that if this pandemic had hit when I didn't have a small child like that, I would read those articles that are like, go out in nature and like talk to a friend. And I'd yeah, be like, yeah, whatever, yeah. I'm just going to stay on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Gonna, like, scrolling. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Like next article. Um, yeah. But because of like the demands that she makes and like the way that her mind is, which is just like an all encompassing state of mind to have a preschooler. Um, and you know, she doesn't, she's not old enough to like really know anything about it or care anything about it. She's like happy <laughs> a lot, <laughs> except for when she's like screamingly unhappy and like requires yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, different kinds of attention. Um, and I don't know. So, but I, I, I hope I came across the right way. And I think I did because of the way that I didn't get angry emails, but I, my whole point in telling the story was to argue that, um, you know, it's like a blessing to have that, but it's a curse to have it if you have to work at the same time or be worried about the care that that person is getting um, or like just stressed out about money constantly. But I don't know, like if I'm at all stressed out and I'm around her, it's just like a disaster because they can tell like, <laughs> they, like the way their minds are, they can tell they build on it. Um, and so I just am like really grateful and really worried for everyone who doesn't have the opportunity um or you know stressed out about that that thought um and that you know fingers crossed maybe people will go read it who listen to this and they'll be like oh this privileged horrible person no i don't think <laughs> so well i mean I but but i think what's what i really appreciated about it is it's it's one of the pieces that i would put with some others about the intensification of relationships at this time yeah and there's this this mm -hmm. sort of insane duality where we're at the one on the one hand we're so um most of us who are trying to you know follow good public health practices and who have the privilege to not be out doing essential work every day we're we're remote from most of our normal day-to-day -day relationships as we would have had them before march yeah. but then we have this intensification of relationships in in the household yeah and mm -hmm. and so and that for some people is is apparently leading to divorce and abuse and addiction. But for others, it's a whole spectrum of, of things. Yeah. And, and I think that's what, that's why I really liked reading it because I think it took a deep dive in one part of that bigger story about America's emotional life at this time. I'm glad you got that from it. Cause I had, I, had, I actually had a, I had a colleague that has a similar like feeling about pandemic life where she's sort of like, everything is terrible, but my home life has never been better. Like it's actually great. <laughs> um, and yeah. I've been trying to figure out how to write about that for a long time. Like I, um, yeah. especially because a lot of the things that I think have made this time good are things that like various child rearing advice people would recommend, which is like not, not over scheduling, not trying to do too many things, like letting there be big blocks of time at home where the kids can just like chill and be, um, but, and so, but then, but then it always felt like, like, I, I think I, I just decided to write about it the way that I did. Cause I was like, I think it just needs to be a personal story, like one story and not be like, some people are feeling better. <laughs> and like, I noticed right. that the, um, 
I think the Washington Post had a piece that was a little bit more universal that was about kids that were actually doing great mm-hmm. in quarantine. <laughs> and it was like, this kid invented, you know, a new way to do yeah, this, yeah, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah. Like, um, and with quotes from the people who are like free range childhood advocates, like about how great it is not to have scheduled activities. Right. Um, and of course that, and that's what's interesting about it. I, I like your um, description of the intensification because it is the case for some people in some ways they're like weirdly happier and then, but then it's just like so unpredictable <laughs> or maybe not unpredictable. Maybe it's just very obviously related to privilege and socioeconomic or I don't know. I don't know how to well, describe uh, it, but it's that, but it's that complex of things. So that as the disaster yeah. goes on, people are showing, I think the psychological wear and tear of the daily existential mm-hmm. aspect of it. I don't yeah. think it's been fully normalized yet. I don't think we're in the Cold War. I mean, if this goes on five years, we'll get to a point where people are just like, this is the risk of living and we just go on with it. I don't think people are there yet. I still worry about it every day, about getting sick, right? Yeah. I think a lot of people do. Um, but that's countervailed by the intensification with sustaining intensification of relationships that are providing a counterweight to that fear. and. Putting all of that together, I think, is important. And I think it's like, you're on a lead with this. I think you should follow it. I mean, I think it's- Ooh, more it's, story ideas. Yeah, <laughs> I like that idea. Well, it, it also, I mean, it reminds me of, um, you know, I don't I don't have like a super deep relationship with disaster studies, but it, it, isn't there the idea that after, a, not a disaster like a pandemic, but something like sharp, like an earthquake happens, yeah. right afterwards, people are really kind yeah. to each other, um, which- the, this is like Susan yeah. Solnit. I mean, this is research yeah. going back a long way. Susan wrote yeah. about it in a great way. That's yeah. probably what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, but yeah. Um, but I, don't, I don't know. I mean, and this is like obviously such a different situation. Like the timing is all weird and the presence of the threat is all weird. And I'm sure you guys are having like a field day trying to figure out how to reframe it and like think about it <laughs> in a different well, way. As a historian, I have to say it's, it's, um, the, the, the temporal aspects of it have been very much on people's mind. And that makes mm-hmm. that I'm glad about that. I mean, mm-hmm. this is just inside baseball about disaster studies, but I mean, yeah, I yeah. think a lot of times it's been, the temporal frame has been so short yeah. and this is clearly playing out over a longer period of time. It's had people yeah. rethink sort of what have been unquestioned things like the disaster cycle and, and disaster recovery yeah. and these kinds of things. I think it's, it's good in that sense, but, um, but important again, it's just back to you know the, your article that um, people also make space for their own personal coping and thinking. Mm-hmm. I think self consciously about that. We're yeah. we're almost up on time, but I want to get a chance. I want to remind everybody you're listening to COVID calls. I'm talking to Rebecca Onion, and there's still a chance if you want to get a question in. We are coming up on time, but I wanted to make mm-hmm. sure that I shined a light on. A remarkable project you did with Jamel Bowie um, mm. about slavery that was published mm. on Slate 2017, 16, 17? 15, 15. Uh, I don't know what's happened to me. I know. But, but you, you scooped 16, 19. I mean, the discussions, which of course have been provocative and important, um, but you were already sort of picking up kind of the the discussion of slavery, what, what I would call a slow disaster, you know, how it plays out, what it meant in American life, and how it plays out over a long period of time. You were talking about that a little while ago. So it, I wanna know in the midst of everything that's happened, like how you reflect on that project. And it's um, visitors are, are fine. And I know your time is precious, so we're gonna cut it. But I, I wonder if you just wanna say a- See, I'm just talking to him. Okay. Say a word or two about, it's a topic you've thought a lot about and with Jamel and just the year we've had, the year that African-Americans in the United States have had and that others of yeah. us who wish to be, provide mutual under, aid have also had with them and admiring what they're going through, admiring watching them go through it, I guess. Oh my God, in 15 seconds or less. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, I, did, I also just want to make sure people knew it existed and, and oh, yeah. check it out and go, so go is, read it. But. Yeah, this is the History of American Slavery podcast um, on Slate. And so you can probably Google History of American Slavery podcast on Slate um, or Rebecca Onion, History of Slavery or Jamel Bowie, History of American Slavery. Um, 
so this was a project that, and it's so interesting to remember, like in, we had a, a surge of interest in African-American history in 2014, 15 because of Ferguson. And it was like, everyone was reading ta Coates and everyone was like really into it. And the fact that it sort of resurged this year in this interesting way, like, I don't know if it's the first time that I've been alive that I've seen like a cycle like that in, of interest in history and like particularly in like difficult history. Like I almost feel like this past year or this past, I don't know, year, like, well, since George Floyd, I've, I've just been like, oh my God, I'm having such deja vu, like all the same sort of history stories, all the same, you know, did you know the police came from slave patrols, like all that yeah. stuff. I'm just like, oh my God, we just, we did this and I, I don't know, nothing happened. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know. I'm like, um, like that's like a small taste of how black people feel. Um, I mean, whatever, it's not even a taste. I don't know. It's just yeah. like the, the recurrence of it is what strikes yeah. me yeah. the most this year. I just am like, Oh my God, like that, it's, that was supposed to be the moment, you know, in 2015 that like everyone was re-examining it and thinking about it. And now we're like doing it again. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, which is not to say that it doesn't have value. I, I'm not even talking about it as in like the Black Lives Matter movement. I think you can read that I'm talking about like a resurgent media interest in the history right. of slavery. Yeah, no, that's what I mean too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I can just see how it would just be exhausting to be like, okay, yeah, like this is something you never read about in school and we can talk again about how schools don't teach it and um, how if they do, it's like woefully insufficient and et cetera, et cetera. But it's just like churning and churning again and again. Um, and I just am like, no, we need something more drastic here. Like <laughs> this is like, this like awareness of what it was and what it continues to be is like, has not done the trick, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I've been trying to think about um, John Brown a lot because I just watched the Good Lord Bird mm. miniseries and I wrote a one piece about it and I might write another because I just am like, just obsessed with John Brown, thinking about John Brown a lot and like yeah. what he's meant to people and what, um, what a, like a weirdo and what a, what a weird white person and like kind of amazing white person and whatever. Um, and I just, and I just read this, long piece by Carvel Wallace in the New York Times Magazine that basically is about Good Lord Bird and and the fact that it's a, a white project about the history of slavery. Ethan Hawke is John Brown and he's a producer. And then there's a, I believe the creator is also white. Um, and, you know, there are black actors and, but whatever, but the people who are in control of the project were white. Um, and it was a really good essay. It's really um, smart and um, ambivalent and really like some parts of the miniseries and really questioned other parts of it. Um, and I just, um, I don't know, like I, I'm very, ever since doing that podcast project and reading a lot of history of slavery for it and trying to synthesize it, our approach, our approach was to try to read and synthesize as much as like the up-to-date um, history of slavery scholarship yeah. as possible, which believe me is like a Herculean task. It is, thankfully. Um, yeah. And it had a little bit less of a, um, like an editorial point of view than the 1619 project. Like the 1619 project had an argument, which as you can see by the ruckus around it, like since yeah. it happened, it's been most people, most of the stuff that people have, who disagree with it have been provoked by is like the argument that 1619 was the beginning of American history yeah. or the argument that slavery was inherent in the founding. Um, and you know, I think I, I actually feel like our project just sort of took those arguments for granted in a way. Like, mm -hmm. like I feel like we could have been more controversial maybe if we just like framed it that way. But we just were like, obviously, like we started in 1619 and moved forward. Um, and maybe we weren't making as big of an argument about America writ large. Um, and we're making more of an argument about the evolution of slavery um, and the human experience of it. We tried to, we had each episode be about a person. Um, yeah. And so we were trying to think through what psychologically what it would have what it would have been like, um, and yeah, and I don't know. Like I just I feel like reparations, man. <laughs> like you, yeah. like I don't know. Like I don't know how much awareness is going to go very far. Um, and I sometimes wonder about my own like position as a person who writes and thinks about it, and like how helpful it is for me to even be involved. Like reading that Carvel Wallace piece, I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Like maybe I'll just not write anything about John Brown. <laughs> like, I just right. like let John Brown's life be the legacy, I guess. I don't know. Well, thanks for reflecting on it because the, I think it's, yeah. it, it's, it's so complex and, and, and 
the whole issue of the place of scholarship. I mean, clearly nobody would say, hey, we don't need more scholarship about the African-American experience. No, never. Life, but, but that's yeah. just about where the agreement drops off right there. And we've needed it yeah. more than ever this year. Well, what we needed was people to understand these things and not have to be explained in the moment in the midst Again. of dealing with a pandemic and a climate yeah. crisis and a racism crisis all at the same time. And I think I that's kind of what you're describing is like, you know, we do these. Yeah. It's just like a group education project for white people, like every five years, <laughs> like maybe On, it'll happen again. ongoing at all times yeah. forever. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that, um, I don't know. But that's why I'm like, give, give people money. Like maybe this is my theme now, give people money from the government. I'm like, <laughs> that's the only like answer here for me, but. I so <laughs> I guess we should wrap up. I, you have so many yeah, irons in the fire. Can you just, as we wrap up, could you give us a little bit of a coming attraction, something you're working oh. on, you're excited about? Well, let's see. Um, I'm, oh, I'm interviewing a historian who wrote a book about um, Columbus and Islam, Columbus's reactions against Islam and why they kind of pushed him towards uh, the new world. Alan McHill. And I, I, this is a good example of like, sometimes I get to use my job to read history books that I wouldn't otherwise read. I reviewed a book about Vikings recently. I'm like, I would never get to read about Vikings. <laughs> yeah, like, a, cool. like a professor of American studies. Um, but yeah, so I'm doing a Q and A with him tomorrow. I'm doing a Q and A on uh, yard signs, like the emotions that political yard signs provoke with a political scientist. Um, I'm doing a couple Halloween things, one of which is on the fact that my child has become a goth and is very interested in spooky things, <laughs> and whether that's normal for a four year old. Yeah. Um, Tell um, them Bella Lugosi's dead and just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to thank you, Rebecca Onion, for this time. I knew talking with you we were going to range over a variety of topics, uh, and it's it was great. And I hope everybody will keep up with your writing at Slate and in other venues. And I want to remind everybody you've been listening to COVID Calls, and you can catch COVID Calls every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Rebecca, thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me. Stay healthy, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow, 5 o'clock, for discussion of wildfire and the pandemic with Stephen Pine.